So one of the reasons we do this repeatedly is to develop a habit of um, looking at the materials that we're working with. Uh, and I like to do it at the beginning of the lecture uh, repeatedly so that you can anticipate what is going to be expected of you next time we meet tomorrow morning. So the compression of time between today and tomorrow might help us achieve this. Um, whatever I show you today, there's a good chance that you're going to be facing a similar challenge on a quiz uh, a mere 24 hours from now uh, on how do these two specific features work? How do they do what they do? Here are the four ways that have proven useful. Um, when I brought it up uh, at the beginning of the semester, I wasn't sure how useful they would be. Boy, they seem really useful, more and more. So um, let's use them. As we go through the material today, and boy, is there a lot of material, uh, check out, ask yourself repeatedly, um, how are these, how are the specific features of these sites operating to demonstrate? How are they working? How are they doing what they do in relationship to the larger system of forces? Um, and hopefully, if I'm disciplined, I'll get to this slide eventually, um, which is one of my favorite examples. So, um, one of the challenges of this course, you'll notice, is that those of us who do PhDs, and your TAs will verify this, we focus our careers, especially during the PhD program, on one site and one set of forces and one set of features. And if we're really committed to teaching, we're able to expand that to several sites and several forces operating in close constellation, um, in close proximity to these things. Um, but then we are asked to teach the survey course, um, and it's some things we just feel overwhelmed by how much there is to talk about, uh, and it's really hard. This is one of those classes. Uh, we're looking at four sites and four systems that uh, in previous versions of the survey, I would you know, just teach modern architecture, and I would teach one of these a week uh, if I were going really fast, but um, we're going to do it faster than that. So the first site is uh, Corbusier's Villa Savoie, 1929. He first started thinking about it in 1928. Um, sometimes I, I prefer to talk about the initial spark date, if the spark is important, as in this case. And so um, we're going to use this building to do multiple things. We're going to use this building to demonstrate how Corbusier's five points of architecture do what they do. And what are they doing and how are they doing it? Um, we're also going to use it um, to introduce the idea of formalism. The large system is one of the dominant forces of 20th century architecture, which is the power of beautiful form. And some architects and designers and clients have taken it to an extreme. Uh, and we've seen examples such as Frank Gehry's uh, Guggenheim Museum to be formed for the sake of form, regardless of what else it does. And then we, if we look at, if you will recall, the King of Spain Library in Medellin, it was a clear example of a design that is formed for the sake of form, but it just happened to be deployed in a way that does all kinds of other social, um, it leverages other social forces. And so Villa Savoie has had a, a much larger impact than it ever should have. Uh, it's almost bizarre. Um, and so here we are outside of Paris, um, a private residence set in nature, set up above nature on piloti, which is a fancy French word for columns. And the first of the five points of um, Corbusier's 1925 uh, or 1923, when he first published Towards a New Architecture, his theory of what are the five key characteristics of the new architecture that he was proposing, that then grows to become the international style 
um, uh, that dominates uh, modern architecture around the world after World War II. And so uh, we dig into it. Here are the five points. They're listed um, in the handout. Um, and we're going to go through them one by one. So here we go. The first one is you, the new architecture is lifted off of the surface of the planet uh, and thus freeing up the ground plane uh, for circulation and other things. Uh, and here we see one of those other things is this new machine that enters the, the picture, the private automobile. More on that tomorrow. So uh, the second one that we also see on the bottom floor is the free plan. So the free plan uh, is allowed because the structural forces are isolated in these columns, not bearing walls, uh, but the columns. And we see part of that happening at MIT. It just so happens this room is back to this room, uh, is configured in a very traditional way. It's as if the walls are holding up the floors above. They are not. These walls are not holding up anything but these walls. The ceiling, the floors above, are held up by columns. It's a steel-reinforced concrete structure. And once you've taken care of all that structural business, you can put the walls wherever you want. Uh, in the tradition of pre-modern architecture, those walls go independently. And so this is the idea of the free plan. And here we see it at the bottom floor of the Ville de Savoie. You see the columns doing the structural work. And then the spatially defining membranes, which are increasingly made of glass because you can, like in Mies van der Rohe's brick country house that we saw last time, um, it becomes a thin transparent membrane, explaining an awful lot of what we see in the world today. Uh, the diameter of this uh, free floating membrane is determined by the turning radius of Corbusier's favorite car. And um, as long as you don't hit a column, uh, you're in good shape. Um, and so we move from the first floor, the ground floor, up into the dwelling units of the the dwelling area of the house. The bottom floor is for the servants, which of course was important at that time for this kind of a client. The third point is the free facade. Once the exterior wall is liberated from its weight-bearing uh, tasks, it can now also, like the plan was just liberated, now the facade is liberated. The facade is free to do whatever it wants to do. Like we saw in the Seagram Tower, the facade wanted to be made of as much glass as possible, um, based on Mies van der Rohe's uh, experiments with glass towers. And so Corbusier isn't inventing this. Some would say, well, the Japanese invented this centuries earlier, and we'll look at that uh, later in the course. Um, he is a genius for writing it down and articulating it in a way that makes it possible to work with it, extend it, and um, uh, make it a paradigm that people can build on. Um, I'm going to throw in a bonus concept in here, which is often associated with... Uh, this house because it was the clearest exemplification of this phenomenon. See, the, I use that word, exemplification, uh, of the promenade architectural in French, or predictably enough, the architectural promenade. The, we experience architecture by moving through space. This is a machine, not just for living in, as was also part of his theorization, that houses our machines for living in. This was a machine for moving human bodies through space. You'd be forgiven for forgetting that because what's missing from all of these photos? People. What's up with that? We'll, we'll pick that up later. So we move up, and here we see these windows uh, doing whatever they need to do in terms of framing views because they are liberated from their structural um, obligations. A very closely related principle, but Corbusier felt it was worthy of its own one of the four five points, was the strip window. And so the ribbon window or strip window becomes a horizontal uh, hole in the facade. Uh, in this case, another principle uh, thrown in for, for, uh, for free 
is the merging of inside and outside space. And when we get to examples in the tropics, we'll see a lot more of that. Um, and so this moving between the interior living room and the exterior living room, and we get to this beautiful deck. Uh, it's already part of the second floor. And here it is looking back on the patio uh, up to the roof deck on the upper floor above the third floor, which is number five, the roof terrace. Um, in a, his own way, he was theorizing a, a kind of eco-aesthetic where the ground plane, you no longer dig into the planet to put in your foundations and bury uh, a basement under a building. You uh, free up the ground plane so that it's available for human occupation, for transportation, and on a good day, uh, parks and gardens on a good day. didn't turn out so well. And then you replicate that garden on the roof. So you are doubling the amount of potential open space for the enjoyment of humans. While we're at it, let's develop our skills of plan reading. And so here we have a plan um, of the, the, uh, the Piano Nobile. It says first floor, but that's because a European labeled it. The rest of the world would call uh, this the second floor. What, what do we call this? This would be called the second floor, in the, or the first floor in the rest of the world. Uh, don't get me confused with MIT numbers. Only, only Americans, are the exception, right? Americans are the exception. We call the, the ground floor, we call one. We've been changing a little bit because we're playing games with code um, requirements. Um, but the point is, is that we should get familiar, and I'm sorry this isn't a clear one, but the kitchen is here that we looked at, then the living room, then the outdoor deck. And the way he denotes movement space of the ramps that bring you gradually up, give you a full uh, gradual experience of the space, of this sculptural machine for living, he, we see it on the plan through the diagonal paving pattern. So this is a graphic trick which picks up a theme that uh, very quickly comes up in this building, which is how the drawing process itself starts to play a very important role in design. And here we have photography playing an important role in the design with Corbusier's glasses and hat uh, of the master himself uh, on the table on the roof terrace at the very top of the building. And so the two uh, most fundamental kinds of drawings that we have in architectural design are the plan views and uh, the trick of reading plans is getting a sense of scale by looking at things like stairs and furniture uh, and um, doorways, door, door widths, uh, because we can relate that. We can project ourselves into those plans, and when you get practiced at it, you can now project yourself in and get a sense of what it must be like to be in that space. Section drawings, which are cuts, uh, vertical planes that slice through the building and in this case the slice is located at the ramps so now we get a sense of what it must be like to for a human in this height range of to move up the space to turn and then move up and so get a sense of how we might enjoy that uh, architectural promenade this is a very similar drawing. What's the difference between these two? This one's cut through the ramps. And you look at the dark, the black line. The, the uh, convention is whatever you're cutting through goes black. And so you know that that's where the chainsaw or the lightsaber cuts right through the building, turns black. This is not cut through the ramp. This is cut through that patio. And so we're seeing the kitchen. Um, oh, not the kitchen. That's the bathroom. Um, the living room, I mean the living room here and that that deck, which is a very interesting form. This project is like many of Corbusier's projects are based on this technology which he hoped would be his big money-making uh, venture, which was the Domino House, a play on the words for house, uh, domus, and uh, the uh, domino stacking of horizontal concrete uh, plates. Actually, they're hollow clay tile, um, but stacked on these columns. Once you have this basic configuration, 
using the five points, you can now create free plans, free facades, roof terraces, um, etc. The other thing that's interesting in Corbusier's early work is the uh, vocabulary of fundamental geometry, which uh, he was also a painter, an abstract painter. This was all the rage. And so we have, again, I mentioned this previously, this very interesting dynamic at play, at work, between uh, painting and architectural design, which um, these people were very, the, the great architects of the early modern era, were very highly aware of. Uh, and Corbusier projects this into the urban landscape, um, theorizing that humans favor recognizable platonic forms, which become internalized in the work of people like Moshe Safdie and I.M. Pei. We haven't seen I.M. Pei yet, um, but the Pyramid at the Louvre is one of those basic geometries that I.M. Pei uses. Um, now, the axonometric drawing was an innovation that came late in architecture uh, in the early 20th centuries when it really took off. And it is the quintessential view of the high modern period because it gives a sense of omniscience. It goes hand in hand with the elimination of the human body from all architectural views. And it gives you access to this abstract truth that is beyond human experience. Uh, this was something that was enforced as recently as my architectural training. Um, you have Corbusier theorizing his own house projects, uh, moving through uh, uh, experimentations with solid massings, and then simplifying that with the Sichuan house. We're going to see that example. And then uh, expression of the monolithic form, but then carved out within uh, using the free plan. And then finally, the most complex compositional strategy of them all in the Villa Savoie. And so this was his own uh, theorization. And the Villa Savoie becomes one of the focal points of the uh, 1932 Museum of Modern Art exhibition, The International Style, uh, curated by Philip Johnson, who is the architect uh, of the glass box in New Canaan, Connecticut. And you see some of the... Uh, the greats of who are venerated in modern architecture here, Mies van der Rohe, Corbusier, Walter Gropius, um, uh, as, and Frank Lloyd Wright. We'll talk about him tomorrow. Um, and uh, it becomes, this house is elevated through the theoretical writings of Corbusier and others, through the International Style Exhibition, and takes on a life of its own. Uh, in the post-war period, uh, the five, uh, the New York Five, uh, also referred to as the Whites, uh, all work on projects that are more or less direct extensions of the vocabulary and the conception, the ideas of Corbusier at its apotheosis in, in 1929 when he uh, works on the Villa Savoie. And so we see this, the Smith House in Darien, Connecticut, down the street from where I grew up. Um, Peter Eisenman, another white, uh, famously following the requirements of the abstract geometry to the point where a, when a column lands between, in the middle of the king size bed of the husband and wife client, we have no choice but to split that bed in two, uh, very clearly expressing where the priorities are uh, in a classic formalist uh, prioritization of the requirements of form over anything human uh, in origin. Um, and then uh, another personal note, uh, my teacher uh, in my architectural training, John Haydock, uh, his wall house, which gets built only upon his death in 2000, uh, becomes a very clear example of the aesthetics of drawing itself becoming more significant than any realization. Uh, no physical realization of the house is required. Um, much of the work of the New York Five hang in museums, uh, especially in the case of John Haydock, long, um, much more so, having much greater significance as art than ever as built structure. Picking up the pace, I'm already behind, um, we move to the next topic, 
which I'm uh, making an exception for this lecture. Uh, two projects, both uh, European in origin uh, and by the same guy. Corbusier is the dominant figure of 20th century modernism um, and uh, has left a legacy much larger than he himself ever uh, anticipated and probably gets more credit or blame than he deserves. Um, I wanted to make this focused on Chandigarh in India, but um, this is the building that supports a more uh, intense discussion uh, of how multiple family housing, especially public housing, is what we call it in North America. The rest of the world calls it social housing, um, translated in multiple ways. But um, this is a remarkable, remarkably influential project that was repeated multiple times uh, and uh, its offshoots all over the world. Uh, in the United States, didn't succeed so well, as we'll see. Again, he's taking the five points, and he's putting them into play here at the ground plane, lifting the whole thing up off the ground, freeing up the ground plane for, uh, first of all, humans uh, to recreate, but then it quickly becomes a place for parking. The other most obvious translation is on the roof where the playground using this forest of interesting form uh, to be, create a recreational space for people. And there you see the, the, the building has landed and its legs are supporting it off the surface of the planet to make room for the cars. Um, but here's an interesting thing. The way the, um, the most interesting thing that we love about this building is the clever... Uh, complex way that the units interlock, creating double height spaces in the living rooms. And here we see it. Um, so it uses a skip step elevator. So the elevator will stop on the uh, third floor, skip two floors, and then stop on the fifth floor. Did I do that right? No, six floors. So it skips two stops, stops, and then you can enter both uh, units this way. One, you encounter a living room that's double height and you go up to the rest of the unit. And on this one, you come down to the living room and the rest of the unit is down here. So that's a section that explains this complex interlocking of units in relationship to the uh, corridors, the circulation system. Good thing to sketch. And so inside the unit, looking back at the entry, uh, this shot taken from the living room, uh, looking up to the rest of the unit. So in this case, very small part of the apartment uh, on the floor you enter in. The majority of the apartment is up above. Um, here's um, in plan view how those three floors uh, inter interlock. So this is another way of looking at the same thing. Uh, here's the plan view and the section together. And so this is the kind of view where you can really start to decode the, the relationship between the experience of the space in plan and the experience of the space in section. So this is something I've started to upload the slides to Stellar. So take a look at them there. Take a look at this one there in preparation for the quiz tomorrow. Um, and go through the exercise of imagining yourself walking through the space in section and repeat that by imagining yourself coming into the unit and walking through the space in plan, going up the stairs to the, to the upper level, and uh, just see uh, which one works better for you. And then see if you can make it reconcile these different experiences in a single unified spatial experience. Here we see that interlocking. Here we see it in plan of how the different units work together. Notice that there is no free plan here. Um, for the purposes of efficiency of these units, the free plan is relinquished in order to achieve this uh, very intense uh, interlocking. What do you think is going on here? Here we have the, the open ground, the roof terrace. This is a new thing. This is not one of the five points. This is a street in the air. Um, here's a detail of the two-story window. So. We don't just have plans and sections, we also have details that gives us a sense of how that window might be experienced. These tend to be more technical and more difficult to read. 
And here we have the quintessential view of modernism, the axonometric. Some of you will find this much easier to picture walking in uh, up through the double, experiencing the double height uh, window wall, going upstairs and experiencing that up there. Um, so try that at home. Here we have the street in the air, which is an idea that comes back even as recently as Stephen Hall's project in Beijing, I believe. Um, somehow without learning the lessons of what goes right and wrong, like the Singaporeans would have them do. But you see the street in the air expressed here on the facade. This is a public space with shops, and it's as if uh, he is proposing removing the public space of the street off of the ground plane. And now it's a privatized uh, street in the air, internal to the complex. And so this is part of the larger theme, which turns out to have huge implications uh, for the topics we've already covered um, relating to the death of the planet, where you take the traditional block and lot configuration and you replace it by instead of spreading things out evenly across the landscape and separated by these stingy little street spaces, you stack them up in towers and you liberate the ground plane. It sounds like a wonderful positive vision for humanity uh, and it certainly looks appealing, but it hasn't always worked out that way. The roots of Corbusier's urban ideas, especially as they have their origins in housing, comes from an earlier set of ideas of the Falanstere utopian collective of uh, Charles Fourier, and there are multiple examples of these utopian radical ideas. Uh, children are separated at birth from their parents and collectively raised in nurseries. Uh, work units are uh, formed in order to uh, collectivize labor. Uh, there is no money. Uh, People feed each other for uh, social reasons, and this will come back um, very quickly when we get to uh, some of the uh, Cold War uh, pro proposals coming from uh, the socialist world. Um, Corbusier, like many young men of his class at this time, uh, went on a grand tour, a grand tour of uh, the classical sites of Europe. And in this process, he encountered this monastery in the Emma Valley in Tuscany, uh, outside of Florence. And he stayed in one of the monk cells. And you'll see in this axonometric how every monk cell has is part building and part garden. And so it's this unification of building and garden that he then brings forward. And you see it very clearly in the, in the roof terraces, the way they're integrated in the Villa Savoie. Very... Um, direct emulation of his experience on the grand tour of this monastery to the point where this view from down in the valley is almost exactly the view of his proposal for the multiple family version of the domino house. This is multiple family dwelling building on the domino configuration. So here are his sketches during his grand tour plan and section plan showing the dwelling unit for the monk, the garden, which is walled in, the architecture has left the building. With apologies to Elvis, the architecture has left the building. The garden is part of the architecture. And so here he brings that um, uh, several, a couple dozen years later into his proposal for the Esprit Nouveau Pavilion. This is his proposal for contemporary housing. Uh, you see again the double height living room. Uh, and here you see the interior architecture and the exterior architecture. Here it sits freestanding as a single unit. Uh, and it was supposed to work as a single unit, as you see in the top. But it was also supposed to stack up and operate as multiple family units uh, and this is, he's on his way to developing the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille the, with the interlocking thing. Um, he is greatly influenced by the idea of uh, Eugene Ennard, uh, who took over for Baron von Haussmann, more about him later, uh, in Paris. Uh, he had this idea that if you take a continuous building 
and you have the facade wrap in and then back out and then in again and then back out and you fill those spaces between the teeth with gardens, it appears to be a series of freestanding buildings while having the advantage of being a continuous building with all the efficiencies of infrastructure that are entailed. So he is trying to erode this continuous facade of the street wall, the thing that we've come to really admire, uh, having been deprived of it. But at this point, he's trying to eliminate the horrible conditions of the industrial age city and bring in light and air, which was the secret for health and social well-being and moral citizenry. And so he is proposing um, the radiant city, the ville radieuse, uh, a, a combination of towers with these cruciform shapes that maximize the surface area like a fractal geometry for you math nerds. Um, but also, in a similar strategy, these teeth in plan of these low-rise buildings. And so the idea of the Redan by Enard comes into play very much in his proposal for the 1931 publication, The Ville Radieuse, which has a profound impact. He is separating it into four functions. Dwelling, working, uh, recreation, and circulation that ties them all together. And so this, he didn't invent single-use zoning, but we blame him for that. And why do I say the word blame? Every municipality uh, in North America is now struggling to mix uses to reduce the dependence on the automobile. Number four, circulation. And we can't do it. Why? <laughs> Zoning regulations are, are buried so deeply in every municipal code that we just can't change it. And so we pile layer upon layer of municipal codes to allow multiple uses. Um, and it's all to undo the damage of special single-use zoning back when the big threat to the health and happiness of our families was the dirty factory. Little did we know that we would just move those dirty factories overseas and clean up the ones that are left here. Um, and now the dirty factory is on four rubber wheels and goes everywhere. Uh, and so it's a complicated thing that we'll look into uh, tomorrow. But this was the most positive vision that uh, at the time just seemed like a wonderful world. By stacking uh, these functional units up, we free the ground plane. He was the uber eco uh, ecologist of his age, uh, ironically, because he was proposing to liberate the planet of the surface for more parks and greenery, even if it's hard to see any humans still. Um, but he was part of a larger effort. Uh, architects and planners were experimenting similarly with a further erosion of the evil high-density urban fabric that was considered to be the root of all evil, the pestilence of the industrial worker neighborhood, had to be eliminated by opening it up for light and air. And part of that was to uh, create buildings that worked as freestanding objects. The tower in the park, uh, which is what this was all about, the towers in the park. And by making our buildings objects in space rather than uh, making our streets what we can carve out of just a complete mattress of, or a complete dense mat of density, um, is the way to bring that light and air in. And so we start to get visions of this. The automobile comes in. Uh, the solution is to keep the fragile humans away from the evil. Uh, automobile with grade separated uses, which becomes a very popular thing. It, we thought we had killed it a few years ago, but it's back. Um, and here is a very strange, famous uh, illustration by Hilbesheimer of that importance of that grade separation. The cars uh, miraculously shrink down as the humans, at least there are humans in the picture. Um, and so this is the vision 
of the modern world that is uh, ridiculed in the, uh, I took those slides out, but uh, in film, quite famously, the utopian landscape. Uh, and it even makes its way into a proposal for the city of Paris, the most beloved area of the historic city, the Marais district, uh, where the, the Pompidou Center is now. Uh, here's the Louvre, it gets spared, uh, the Place de la Concorde, the Lac de Triomphe. But this whole uh, area is replaced with the cruciform towers and the winding Redon uh, lower scale housing forms. Um, no one in Europe ever takes him up on this uh, prospect. He really gets a chance to do it when, uh, with the uh, British, the end of the British um, relinquishing control over India, the partition of India in 1947, uh, he gets the chance to design a capital city for the state of Punjab, which bizarrely becomes the capital city for two Indian states, Punjab and Haryana, and uh, in this uh, famous project for Chandigarh. He is most interested in the monumental architecture of the capital district, this vast open plaza, which is the platform for these monumental, sculptural, uh, expressive, exposed concrete buildings. Uh, the French for exposed concrete is uh, beton brut, which gives us the term brutalism. Um, brutalism is not called brutalism because you feel like you've been beaten up. It's called brutalism because it is uh, a, a very high-minded, aspirational, uh, infrastructural attitude towards architecture, that we create the armature for everything else. And we create that armature in a way that is receptive to multiple different outcomes. Uh, and some would call it heroic architecture. Um, and now that it is mostly 50 years or older, the historic preservation movement is scrambling to try to salvage um, the monuments of Baton Brut, or brutalism, or heroic architecture. Um, Corbusier inherits the project when uh, Albert Meyer is uh, killed in a plane crash, tragically, and he retains this idea of an intertwined infrastructure. Uh, the road system is complemented by a secondary system of continuous green space, and it's the inter uh, mingling of those two uh, ideas that was earlier uh, theorized in the Garden City movement um, that we may get to. Um, but we see here it's a very specific attitude towards uh, the disposition of architecture in one direction towards the street and in another direction towards recreational landscape, which is still uh, an important uh, consideration. And so you see up here where Corbusier's main consideration was uh, of the monumental architecture of the capital complex at the head of the project. Some very interesting uh, formal expressions, again that word formalism, that gets emulated all over the world for decades and to the present. Uh, and capped off with his open hand monument. Uh, uh, and as Chandigarh gets fleshed out, it's really the work of Jane Drew and Maxwell Fry, who previously uh, did a great deal of work in West Africa, uh, which I was hoping would be one of the primary uh, points of uh, attention of the course. But alas, we have to let go of some things. And so it's those housing, it's that, those residential designs that take over in Chandigarh uh, and we don't see versions of the uh, Marseille Unité d'Habitation so much as we see the work of Fry and Drew um, in the, what we see today in Chandigarh. Now, um, Corbusier traveled. Uh, he famously uh, said that the view from the airplane is the view of modern man. And he, being a man of, of the 20th century, he used the word man. And, uh, and so this view from the air, especially on his journeys through South America, led him to intense interest in the future of Latin American cities. He had a big influence uh, through Jose Luis Sert on the city of Medellin. And um, uh, so he connects there. This is Brasilia and the 
the biggest uh, idea of Brasilia that comes out of Corbusier's urban ideas is the super block, that we don't have these tiny little uh, 200 feet by 600 feet blocks like you see in Manhattan. We have super blocks or super quadra in uh, Spanish. And within each of those super blocks, uh, one of the great uh, positive turns of this whole thing is they permitted sensibly all of the four functions within the super block. And so we don't have uh, such a vast distance uh, to walk to get a, a loaf of bread. That's really the test of 21st century modernism. You need diapers. You need a quart of milk. How far do you have to go? Do you have to get in your car? If you live in Florida, the average is 17 times a day. But if you live in New England, maybe in a place where you can walk to the corner store, uh, it's a very different reality. Uh, here, the, the larger segregation between... Um, the pink and the green is um, between governmental symbolic cultural uh, assets and these residential, um, these mixed use uh, areas of this, and then the circulation and the monumental ceremonial axis running uh, through the center. Um, but interestingly, the construction workers, when they were building this, uh, established other towns on the outskirts that fit all of the characteristics of informal settlements from our first lecture. Uh, this, these photographs, which are just, I show them because they're just so powerful and sublime, uh, gives you a sense of the heroic power of uh, these forms as they emerged on the landscape. Um, here's the view down the ceremonial center. And Iwan Ban uh, is, gets credit for naively, but wisely, Going back to photograph Chandigarh, Brasilia, uh, the monuments of Corbusier, and very slyly uh, working uh, for us, and by us I mean humans, to bring us back into the picture. Literally, he considers his photography to be portrait photography in the presence of uh, powerful architecture. And so I'm a huge fan of his work. Um, Here's uh, the stair by Oscar Niemeyer, just died at the age of bazillion. I'm not sure how old he was, but this amazing staircase that you would never get approved. Um, and a human body, um, almost direct quotation from Marcel Duchamp's uh, New Descending the Staircase. Um, next topic. Coming out of this whole discussion of formalism in Villa Savoie and multiplying the single family dwelling into multiple family dwellings and getting into the issue of public housing, we get into the crisis of public housing. Why would I say crisis of public housing? Anyway. Why is it a crisis? There's so many people, so the demographic crush that we talked about in the first lecture. But why else? Yeah. Because if you don't have enough public housing and affordable housing, you can start developing informal housing. Right. That's another one, informal housing. And specifically for uh, people experienced in North America, what is the crisis of public housing? Yes. Um, racial segregation. It's what? Racial segregation. Racial segregation. Crime drugs, deteriorating conditions, um, Detroit, I don't, I don't need to say much more, you get the picture. Public housing, don't be fooled by the example of Singapore that we looked at where it worked brilliantly. It hasn't worked brilliantly everywhere, uh, so why is that? And so this is kind of the second wave of interest in public housing, uh, which gets into this idea of reflexive. When I say the word reflexive, I'm trying to uh, transcend the trope of not just history, but everything, where we tend to think of things in terms of cause and what comes after cause? Effect, yeah. And so because we're so uh, fatigued by this idea, the reason slums are the way they are is because the housing is bad. That's the cause of the effect. And so let's just bulldoze the housing. 
and replace the slums. Well, they didn't do that in Medellin from the first lecture. They kept all the houses. Thank you. Just keep the houses the same. Let's do something else. And so they leapfrogged this cause and effect. Uh, architecture is the source of our problems. Architecture is going to solve the problems. Instead of being cause and effect driven, because um, every effect has the tendency to be what? A, it quickly turns into a cause. And so now what? So chicken, it's more chicken egg than it is cause and effect. And if you increase the oscillation, the velocity, the frequency of that flipping between cause and effect, here we go, there's the, there's the visual, it becomes reflexive. And so these two things have a relationship to each other. If you look at it in a really small time frame or in great detail, sure, cause and effect can be useful. But if you, if you start with cause and effect and then you stop with, at that, you end up with these false paradigms where you end up thinking that architecture is the problem and or architecture is the solution. It's not. It's part of a relationship. And that's kind of what we see in Medellin, Colombia. And we see it again here with the uh, experimental housing project in Lima, Peru uh, that dates back to uh, 1968, 1969, when a very brave uh, president uh, decides to initiate this, um, this ex experiment in, in housing, where instead of taking a Corbusier approach, where you build it and then people conform to that uh, configuration, you build an armature. It's more in the keeping with the spirit of Baton Brut, where you build this armature and it gets occupied like a beehive. And the, the, the species and the sentient beings who occupy these spaces take over. And so it starts like this. And this is not a failure. This is success. The occupants take over and they make it do what they need it to do. And so um, this is very recent uh, research that is all the rage um, these days. But uh, the president invited uh, all the big names in architecture of that moment and gave them a piece of land uh, in the Previ complex and said, let's just see what you got. And uh, and so this is the complex, and this is when it gets built out. But again, you see something familiar. It's all white. It's all formally um, distinctive. Like you can tell Aldo Van Eyck from James Sterling. I forget what he is. I think that, yeah, these windows are James Sterling from Charles Correa. Uh, a lot of these people taught, or Charles Correa, I think he still teaches here. Um, and so uh, they each get their own district, and the question is, what happens? Now, Aldo van Eyck is a special case uh, because he spent a lot of his time studying anthropology, and he thinks that anthropology, or he thought that anthropology was important for architecture, um, which makes him not a white. Uh, the whites believed in the power of form, uh, in opposition to the whites, we see the emergence of the grays. These architects are the grays. And there's this, again, it's a false dichotomy because a lot of the grays worked with Corbusier. Uh, Team 10 uh, emerges out of Corbusier's office. Uh, as a matter of fact, the two names that we saw attached to the Unité d'Habitation are two of the key figures who started Team 10. Team 10 grew out of SIAM, C-I-A-M, the International Congress for Modern Architecture that was dominated for many decades by Corbusier. When there was a pushback against especially the ville radieuse ideas and the four functions of separation, it was Corbusier who said, you think you can do better? Please, you take over. He handed control of SIAM to these radical youth and Aldo van Eyck was one of them. And so Aldo van Eyck's work is all about creating the armature for the inhabitants to actually complete it. And that has become a very strong identifiable strain in architecture, uh, especially in housing. Um, which takes us back to this moment where we see the, the perimeter housing uh, almost like the Redon 
form of Villeray is, uh, creating these very well-defined street facades, these outdoor rooms of the streets, and then an interior courtyard. It's safe for children. And the idea is that children are the indicator species of architectural success and failure. If your children can run outside without you running after them uh, to protect them, then success. If it's, uh, and so you have these object buildings sitting in these courtyards that are framed by the housing, which creates a, a protective crust from the outside world. Again, in an odd way, uh, to what we saw in the green versus road of Chandigarh. Uh, but configured differently. And we'll see it again in the Garden City. And so the children do run out of the house and into the central courtyard where uh, the eyes, uh, the windows become eyes on the street, which is a famous uh, principle from Jane Jacobs and uh, Neumann uh, about defensible space. Now, all of a sudden, these are very clearly anthropologically driven ideas. It's not about the form and the form alone. It's what does the form do? How does the form allow these relationships uh, to these symbiotic relationships between humans operate? Uh, and so this becomes uh, ever increasing consideration in the backlash to, uh, to this. And so this, the theme that holds this together is you can't always start on an empty plain of uh, rice paddies like we are in, in China now. Sometimes it's the existing cities were bombed in World War II or they're uh, ripe for renewal and so they get bulldozed if they what's left after the bombing or if you're in North America you just bulldoze it um, and you insert this new fabric in the existing city. So how do you do that well? In 1927 the, the Weisenhof Siedlungen looks at some of these housing issues, uh, we go back to Corbusier and his five points and how that might uh, play out. This is his Sichuan house. Uh, he had a whole series of Sichuan houses. He was good friends with the, um, the automobile manufacturer of Sichuan. And this is another play on words. It's not spelled the same. Uh, but he was looking for a way to mass produce housing the way automobiles are mass produced. Again, the double story facade. Uh, in the Weisenhof Siedlungen that was uh, curated by Ludwig Wies Mies van der Rohe, our friend from uh, last week, um, again, a who's who, and this predates Previ by several decades, uh, but Previ was very much a counter Weisenhof. And so this was a showcase of what are the possibilities of modernist international style white concrete, uh, plastered uh, box houses. And so here we see a variant on the five points. Um, and then uh, famously, around the same time, Corbusier builds uh, PASAC, the, um, the public housing, the social housing, using the, the European term, the social housing complex in PASAC, France, where it's very much uh, a direct uh, outgrowth of his Sichuan house. You can see a few of them there and the uh, Esprit Nouveau approach. Um, but a strange thing happens. Uh, famously, the occupants start to paint the walls, which throws Corbusier into a tizzy. Um, and he, he could have continued to his prescient genius anticipating uh, everything that was ever going to happen. He's almost like a time traveler. He anticipated everything, but not this. He got this one wrong. Um, so instead of going out in front uh, saying people should change their houses, he objects to those pitiful, dirty humans messing up his architecture. Uh, and so here we see it's become um, the focus of a lot of ridicule over the years. Um, uh, in contrast, we see Aldo Van Eyck, one of the key people of Team 10, and I mentioned that Corbusier hands over control of Siam to these young upstarts from his office. They partner with uh, key figures in multiple countries around Europe, including Aldo van Eyck from the Netherlands, who here's an analytical uh, plan uh, take on his orphanage in Amsterdam, where 
the circulation space, I'll remember circulation space in Corbusier's city is for cars and for connecting all these separated functions. In contrast, Team 10 and Aldo van Eyck, remember he's the one who was into the uh, anthropology, he creates these different zones for school communities where all the functions are mixed uh, very creatively so that if someone's doing one thing, it's in the proximity of someone cooking in the kitchen and someone building something, someone taking a nap, someone playing with blocks. And then rather than being highly efficient corridors, freeways like the infinite corridor, back to the infinite corridor uh, topic, he creates these spaces of circulation that are much more than just circulation. These are the social spaces in which the members of these different communities interact. So back to that issue of streets, um, and instead of the four functions of the city, the Team 10 in their uh, 53 Dorn Manifesto proposed the four scales of human association, being the house, the street, the district, and the city. And they go on to say, of these four, there's a lot of attention being lavished on the house, which is what we've been talking about this whole lecture. And these other things are important, uh, but they're too much to take on right now. This is the one we're going to deal with, the street. The scale of the street, it's larger than the arch what architecture typically deals with these days, but uh, it was very much about creating these non-linear superhighways like the Infinite Corridor. It was very much like the student street in the status center, um, taking advantage of the opportunity to string some of these ideas together. And so you see the relationship between the historic city and the modern city starts to take on a totally different character uh, that is more sensitive to these timeless relationships of humans in space. Um, and so they, they maintain this, this vocabulary of the international style form they even adopt uh, Corbusier's separation of, off the ground plane, Corbusier and Hilbesheimer and everybody else, um, making the world safe, uh, creating a level that's safe for humans. Uh, it usually doesn't work if you've been to St. Paul or Duluth or the Embarcadero Center in San Francisco. Um, Highline is, is a recent exception, but these separate levels have a tendency to become deserted. Um, and so we have sensibly pulled back from, from doing this in, in favor of an approach called complete streets where the traffic slows down, the sidewalks get wider, you have baby carriages and segways mm -hmm. and bicycles, etc., all uh, inter interacting socially on the street. And so Corbusier, again, steals the thunder by thinking of this decades before Team 10 and um, where the uh, the streets in the air idea of uh, unité d'habitation um, is, is fit into these linear blocks in the traditional city. And then it comes um, in the Team 10 proposal. Allison and Peter Smithson were primary figures in, in Team 10. In this competition, they um, bring in this idea of streets in the air, where the social life occurs uh, with Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio in the foreground uh, at multiple levels. So you see multiple streets in the air, unlike Unité d'Habitation. Uh, so you see it multiple times, connecting buildings across the landscape. And so this is their photo montage proposal uh, that follows very closely what Corbusier had said earlier. It gets built. Um, it works, but then it doesn't work. Uh, there's really the sense of publicness of these streets in the air leaves much to be desired, and it isn't as socially mixed. And um, so we famously get to um, this. What is this? Koya Anastatsa, Philip Glass, the moment in 1972, and the residents uh, made famous in, what's his name? Wolf, the writer, the novel. He wrote, uh, about the moment in the auditorium where the, the residents are meeting to try to figure out how to fix Pruitt Igo in St. Louis, Missouri. And the chant starts the way he tells it quite dramatically. The chant starts in the back of the auditorium, tear it down, 
tear it down. And, it, and the public officials agree. And the, the false reading of history by Charles Jenks is that this was a failure of design. He's uh, saying that because the architecture was not good, uh, architecture was unable to save the world uh, in this case. And so uh, it was a failure of architecture, and the solution is still architectural, taking a cause and effect, very simple cause and effect relationship. What Previ does is it flips that and points out how it's a reflexive relationship, that architecture and life have a way of working back and forth in frequent oscillations of cause and effect. Um, These developments are run by well, the I don't have the, the speakers on, but this is um, an excerpt from the Prude-Igo myth, a recent film that looks at this question, what really went wrong in Prude-Igo? And they make the point that the residents were not just pleased, they were ecstatic to move into this new housing. And then the city abandoned them. Uh, the, the maintenance went, uh, went south uh, and crime. It became a, a, um, a place of, of great crime where the police and the firefighters were reluctant to respond to calls. And so it was not a failure of architecture, uh, as Charles Jenks uh, famously stated, it, uh, it was a failure of political will and public institutions, um, bringing us back to the larger view of history. Um, and so Charles Jenks points to this as the moment when postmodernism began. Here's uh, an analysis by one of my students where you, you can pick out the spaces and the elements, uh, the historic pieces versus the, um, the contemporary pieces of the 1957 Barbican Estate in, in London where the, the Blitz took out much of the fabric of the city and it was rebuilt in the post-war period. Uh, currently renovated a very successful example, like Singapore, of public housing. The architecture is similar to Pruitt Igo, but the social supports are very different. Very mixed functions in here, cultural, uh, social, schools, church, uh, a lot of stuff. And you can actually uh, from this kind of a view, pick out some of these elements with a little bit of research and figure out how it works. And then the last example from this part is um, a very recent project uh, from someone who taught here very recently, um, Alejandro Aravena, uh, in his half houses. The government of Chile gave him money to build new housing for people, but it's uh, the more you spend on land, the, the less, you, the less, the fewer families you can help. Uh, and so the typical thing is to uh, locate this on land outside of the city. Well, these were squatters in the city, and to move them out would be to uh, eliminate or disconnect them from their social and economic opportunities. And so um, these half houses uh, allowed them to spend that money uh, in ways where you start with this, then the people come in, and they finish the houses like this. Uh, and so this has become um, a very dramatic uh, new thing, even though it's not new at all, and things like this have been happening. Uh, we saw it in Previ, uh, but this is very much the inheritor of Previ, and related very closely to what happens in Medellin. Finally, in uh, the last few minutes remaining, uh, we look at, um, coming full circle, uh, Renzo Piano is a heroic star architect. Um, he has recently completed a, a museum down the street. He is uh, an architect's architect. He invents new details and assemblies at a very fine grain for every project. Thus, his firm is called Renzo Piano Building Workshop. He came to fame with this project, um, in the part of Paris that Corbusier proposed uh, bulldozing, uh, Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano's 1972 uh, Pompidou Center, also known as Beauberg, uh, was a project that uh, came out of a very partial uh, demolition of the neighborhood and is credited for uh, bringing a high-tech aesthetic into being uh, of functionalist, hyper-functionalist architecture. So in a way, it grew directly, it's the direct inheritor 
of the functionalist instincts of the European high modern architects, Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, Hilbesheimer, uh, all of the people we saw exhibited in the 1932 International Style Exhibition, these are the inheritors, Renzo Piano um, and Richard Rogers, and they do a hyper-functionalist expression of all the mechanical systems, the structural elements, and they win huge prizes and recognition, and it is identified as a new direction for modern architecture. Uh, so this project stands in very stark uh, contradistinction to that one. Renzo Piano is one of those architects, unlike Frank Gehry, where you don't just do the next version of a series uh, on every new site. Instead, you start over from scratch and you readdress what is architecture with every project. You don't repeat things. And so uh, in the final, one of the final um, grand projets of the French government, uh, which is an interesting topic in and of itself, the French government under Mitterrand, says we need to uh, celebrate and reestablish the greatness that is France. And uh, so not so different from the Chinese or the Singaporeans or Dubai. We're going to do it by demonstrating our greatness through great projects. And so La Défense, uh, uh, Pompidou Center, and uh, complaints. So these projects roll out over more than two decades. The complaints come in the form of, hey, Everything's in Paris. France is a big place. And so the response is, oh, you want to do something outside of Paris? We'll go way out. So the French colony, yes, it's still a colony, of New Caledonia in the South Pacific, uh, where this freedom fighter, uh, Jibao, uh, is assassinated during the struggle for independence. He was actually someone more sympathetic to negotiating with the French government He's assassinated as a moderate, and so they um, uh, decide that this Grand Projet will be in New Caledonia, the Jibao Cultural Center, uh, where Piano, one of the first things he does is he hires an anthropologist to help him understand the Kanak culture native to the island. And so this is a landscape project. It is a project that looks at the natural environment as a point of inspiration. It looks at the material culture of the Kanak people as a point of inspiration, right down to the details. So, and I'm going to introduce a word here that has become very useful uh, in understanding architecture over the last few decades, uh, tectonics. This is a word uh, that was popularized by Kenneth Frampton in his theorization of uh, tectonic uh, expression in architecture, that it's not just... Um, the big symbolic issues, he's trying to bring us into exemplification by saying there's something about the materiality of a place. If certain woods are, are harvestable in this location, if the light falls in a certain way, if the humidity, if the ground has a lot of clay, these highly localized, specific, um, visceral experiences of that place need to be brought into the architecture, and thus his idea of tectonic culture. And so um, he doesn't get a chance to use this example uh, because it predates his, I think he's caught on to it now, but this example seems to very clearly demonstrate how the Connaught culture with its building traditions related back to the material landscape can be brought in, translated, even created, uh, translated through highly technical means in, through the invention of these um, new joints of steel and finger joint meshing with the wood. Uh, but he draws these drawings where nature is not kept out. The human is not kept out. The spatial experience isn't kept out. So here is a section that simultaneously ties it to the human culture, to the natural environment, uh, to the experience of place, and then how do you build it? So a wonderful example of pulling multiple things together. Um, designed on this landscape through multiple variations, tested in France, um, tested and retested for its technical performance, uh, put in the landscape uh, with this extremely inventive uh, technology to the point where the, the meanings that are embedded and are carried forward with this material reality are now juxtaposed 
with this material of reality. And it's almost as if this juxtaposition allows a transfer of meanings and experiences from uh, these pre-modern traditions. It's almost by simply occupying this place and having it be the site of human interaction that this becomes available, no guarantees of success, uh, but this becomes available to now to start to take on meanings through these four mechanisms and probably much more. And so um, looking at the clock, I think we're going to end it there.